When you experience post-exertional malaise or a crash, it can feel like you've caused damage that's permanent, it's irreparable. And that's really hard because it's hard to break a cycle of feeling like you have to stay within a certain energy envelope, but then also being able to somehow break it. There's actually an important window in being able to push that forward as long as we understand what are the underlying constraints. Like what are the what are the rules of the game that we have to operate in in order to push that energy envelope effectively? So that's what we're gonna talk about in this video. Now, I don't have a one size fits all for everyone to solve post-exertional malaise, but what I will talk about are the concepts that are important so that in your particular body, we can understand what are the rules here and then how do we play within those rules to be able to push your system in a way that your body can not just crash and falter and feel like you're injuring the tissues, but actually use that in a way to feed your body that stimulus so that it can get stronger again. So the common perception of MECFS is that it's a, it's an energy production issue, right? And you may hear this described as it's a problem with the mitochondria being able to produce enough energy, or maybe we're not able to, uh, to have enough mitochondrial activity, right? People think this because this is the common thing that's taught. It becomes problematic though, because the more that we practice decreasing energy, the more your body is going to be incentivized to decrease the machinery needed. So if I'm, if I'm laying down all the time, it turns out that we become really good at laying down and that's not so great for standing up. So we know this because we can look at studies where they compare athletes versus normal people on bed rest. So you put people on bed rest, it turns out whether you're an athlete or a normal person, it doesn't take very long for your body to start changing, to start plasticity, to start actually modifying its own outputs to match what you're doing. So it's kind of like, oh, sweet, we lay down now. We can just throw all this stand up stuff overboard. We don't need it anymore. And that's how the body responds to that. If you're just a normal person, within two days, we start to see that there's a relative hypovolemia that starts. So a lot of you will perk up to that because if you've been diagnosed with POTS or anything that's orthostatic, they talk about like low blood volume a lot. But we know if you don't have to push blood up to the head, then the necessity to be able to distribute blood goes down. We just don't, we just don't have to use it as much. So the body responds to that. Within about four days, we start to see neurally mediated changes. And what that means is your brain is starting to downregulate all the processes that go with standing up because you're not doing it. This is the same thing we see when we send people off into space and they don't have to deal with gravity anymore. So not only does it affect your ability to detect upright, to deal with upright gravity, but it also starts to make your muscles start to atrophy. All the systems that go against resisting gravity and standing up just kind of become less useful. So the idea of radical rest becomes kind of problematic in this sense because we are on a we are on a time lapse where now we're progressing these systems. We're we're actually supporting them moving further in this direction. Um, so this becomes super problematic, and this kind of create this creates the friction, right? Because on one hand, you don't want to do too much because you know it feels terrible, and you're going to be symptomatic, and it doesn't seem to progress into anything that becomes useful after that. But on the other hand, by resting only, resting exclusively, we're now in a position where we know we're taking on the role of degenerating systems within the body. We're creating the deconditioning that people are accusing you of. So we have to somehow split the split the middle on that and be able to say, how do we how do we dose activity appropriately so that we're stimulating not just the whole global system the way we want to, but the areas that are specifically problematic, how do we attack those in a way where we're basically taking all of that energy that we're storing and pushing it into the one system that is problematic for you? And by doing that, we're saying we're not going to waste trying to burn energy in all of these systems at one time. We're going to focus on the one that is the linchpin, kind of the, the, the catalyst that will allow the whole system to start being able to do those activities again. And I think that part's... Uh, probably the part that we're missing because it's a little bit of Goldilocks, right? It can't be too hot. It can't be too cold. It's got to be in the middle. So we got to know 
how do we start to get to understanding what is the middle for you? So if you have MECFS, we know that there was a catalyst moment where like you were doing great and then something happened and then you were no longer doing great, right? And so like that, that becomes the core problem. But then just the function of like what that does to knocking you out of the game starts to create problems that are knock-on effects where now we start to create these deconditioning problems. So these become problems that aren't even necessarily the same ones that we have from the original problem. So we wanna be able to work back through that whole system and get to the original problem. For many people, that original problem is gonna resolve or is gonna revolve in some way around how we are able to manage the blood flow into the brain. We've talked about the fact that MECFS is a neurally mediated problem. It's a, it's a problem in the nervous system, which translates to it's a problem in your brain. So what we want to focus on is rather than saying like, we're just going to condition you, let's get you back on the treadmill. Let's get you a trainer, you know, let's get you in the gym and just gut it out. It's probably not that useful because herein we are creating an energy deficit problem. We're taking all this energy and pushing it into systems that we can't control because the main problem is that we're not able to feed our brain. So what we want to shift to is thinking about how do we actually just focus on exercising those systems within the brain that manage how all of this works. And what we find is you're not even exercising the whole brain. You're taking care of resuming function in very specific areas of the brain that allow you to then be able to get blood flow back in. And it turns out if you can get blood flow to your brain, it's much better at controlling the entirety of the rest of the system, which then allows us to be able to generate neuroplasticity. Guess what happens? Is we're able to actually activate mitochondria, get more density, and to be able to produce more energy. And so if we turn the problem on its ear and just look at it slightly differently, it allows us to take all of this, like this huge problem and focus it into a very small area that becomes much more manageable. The unifying factor that seems to be true in a vast majority of cases of MECFS is that number one, we can measure that when you're upright, the amount of blood flow to your brain is less. And we can also measure that the relative amount of end tidal carbon dioxide is less. These point to problems with being able to get enough blood flow to operate your brain well, and then we get all of the knock-on problems that come with that. So rather than focus on overall fitness, that's the goal later, but the first goal is, can we start to get that fitness back in the brain? So the same way you think about graded exercise, right? We start slow and work up. You can think about that same, use that same concept, but understand it in the way of how do I need these reflexes within my nervous system to be able to dose up and get stronger again so that I can tolerate sitting up. I can tolerate sitting up for a long time. I can tolerate standing. I can tolerate standing and then moving my head and then also talking to people and then also walking. And then we get into running or jogging or doing the rowing or, or whatever it comes to there. But if we can take it in those small steps where we're letting that brain get better at getting blood flow into it, then we open up huge doors to allow the system to be able to then connect to all the things that go with getting back upright again, getting back into the world. And then we're not fighting directly with this energy envelope, we're more focused on, can we get blood flow first and then just watch that energy envelope expand from there. So the idea of exercising your brain can feel foreign, a little bit confusing. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? Um, but it's important in the sense that normally people would think about if you're exercising your brain, you're like doing math, you're learning languages, you're, you know, you're standing on one foot, hopping around. That's not really what I'm talking about. When you think about all the things that go with standing upright, Almost none of them do we ever have to even think about. And what that means is that they're automatic. This is where autonomic system comes from. But another way to think about that is like a reflex. And when things are reflexes, we don't have to think about them. They happen automatically. But in these cases, what we find are there's a consortium of different reflexes that can have errors with the way they talk to each other. So whether that's the way that you feel your blood pressure in your body, in your neck, or in your brain, the way you feel the pressure in the, the way your body interprets pressure in your heart or in your lungs or the way you're breathing, the amount of oxygen in your blood, all of these things go together to create this big picture of then how to distribute blood through the system. So we take those all apart and we want to think about how are they each, how are each of them working individually 
and how are they working when you combine them with other tasks? And that helps us be able to dial in on where do we want to aim? And when we think about exercising the brain, most people don't start from a position where they're doing a lot of things. If they could do them already, then it wouldn't be a problem and we wouldn't need to exercise them. So it's just like if you're learning how to do a pull-up for the first time and you can't do a pull-up, someone's going to be spotting you, helping you with that first pull-up, or you're using a band or something like that because your ability to do one on your own isn't there. So that's a good model to think about it in because a lot of the things that we're doing with people, we are giving them a stimulus. And we're giving them the smallest, a small enough stimulus so that their body can interpret it. So we can see the outcome, the reflex starts to work again. And then you're building it. It's the graded exercise idea is that you're building that stimulus up until it's strong enough to where then the patient, you, that person is able to then start doing things on their own and then scaling on their own. So we start from this kind of passive idea, passive structure where the stimulation is happening to you. And then we progress that in ways where then you are starting to take part in it and then scaling that into more and more kind of normal ADL or activities of daily living ideas, standing, walking, moving, doing all the fun stuff. So we know the starting place for a lot of people is understanding this problem of blood flow to the brain, cerebral blood flow. This is a thing that we can measure. It's easy to do, happy to do it. And then from there, though, we have to say, well, what caused that? Which one of these reflexive systems or systems within the brain is breaking down? So, for example, um, you may have a problem in the vestibular system. The vestibular system is your balance system. It allows you to feel balanced so that you're able to be upright. Now, some people will have balance problems. You probably have seen where they go to the fair, they get on the tilt-a-whirl, they get off, they puke, they're dizzy, they're all the things because it's it overwhelms their inner ear, their vestibular system. So for people in this cohort, just going from laying down to standing up is like riding that tilt-a-whirl. It overwhelms the system. They're not able to compensate it. And then we see errors in the way that they're able to then carry out their job in helping with distribute blood flow. Some people have problems in the baroreceptors in their neck where something happens, maybe they've injured their neck or they've got an infection. That catalyst is enough. So now they have a hard time sensing how much blood pressure is changing with every heartbeat, with every breath they take. There's too much fluctuation and then we get a problem. So that's another reason. Some people have problems with autoregulation. This is like the blood flow measurement that's happening in your brain. And this was a big thing, especially with people that had endotheliitis. This is like our post-COVID group where that autoregulatory system didn't work the way it was supposed to. So I could have normal blood pressure all the way up into my neck, but I'm not getting a transfer into the systems in my brain. So we have to work on that. Some people, it might be they've got a car accident. So they get a neck injury and we end up in that same boat with the tilt-a-whirl thing. So when I turn my head and neck, the sensors in my neck make me dizzy in the same way. And I might feel that, but it affects the integration of the brain's ability to control blood flow into the brain as well. So all of these things that have to do with posture, with balance, with detecting movement, with detecting changes in pressure within the system, they all are potential uh, attack vectors, maybe we could say, where when something happens in those systems, the downstream effect is that it ultimately affects our ability to adequately get blood to the head, especially when we're standing up. So we started off this conversation today talking about the fact that there isn't a universal fix, and hopefully that's kind of become a little bit more obvious as to why that is. But even though there's not a universal fix, there's not a solution that is like one size fits all for everyone, we still have to find a way to get a solution, right? So the place we start is starting with, are we getting enough blood flow to the brain? Great place to start from. From there, what are the systems that are involved in that? And when I stress them, when I test them, how do they affect that cerebral blood flow? And then that gives me a window to then say, I'm going to take my energy envelope, the the amount of energy I have, and I'm going to focus it on improving the function or the fitness in that one system. And then what I want to see is when I improve the fitness in that one system and measure that, does that start to then have effects in within how the whole system works together? And then can I measure those changes in cerebral blood flow? And then can I start to see 
outcome changes where we can do more things because doing more things is what turns into feeling better. It doesn't usually go the other way around because as we talked about earlier, if we've been in this place for a long time, which I know a lot of people have been and it sucks, but there's an amount of like building yourself back up that is necessary. This becomes the avenue to do it. So as you can do more, the feel better starts to come with that. And that's my hope for everyone. Um, so hopefully this at least starts to give you a different way to think about it, a different way to ask questions, a different way to, to look into the world. And that may help give you some answers coming back your way. So I hope that helps. Leave us some comments. Let us talk to us about your journey. It helps everyone, honestly, if you can share the things that are good, things you're working on, and that can give other people ideas, which can be really supportive. And we can do that in a way that's really positive.